But it's also an opportunity to go back and think about an exhibition, get a small taste of it. Uh, it's called Have You Seen a Horizon Lately? Um, later on in the conversation, we can ask, um, we can ask uh, Marianne uh, about the title and where it comes from. Uh, Yoko, ono, Yoko Ono is involved. Uh, but let's begin by actually going and looking at some art. I'd like to invite um, Felipe maybe first uh, to show us the work that you made for this exhibition and maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the process uh, that was involved in making it and how it fits into your overall artistic process. Okay, um, I don't know if you can share some images I prepare for this presentation. Uh, well, hello everybody and uh, thank you to Macal and Marianne uh, and Siddhartha for organizing this conversation. I think uh, getting together even through this media, it's something that we have to do and especially in this international setting and sharing experiences from different locations. Um, I, for this exhibition, I, um, we reconstruct this piece that is called Tropico and Tropico, and it's made with uh, two kinds of sugars. One is white sugar and the other is raw sugar. And these, um, these two materials reproduce this uh, pattern, graphic pattern that had been migrating from one culture to the other, but that actually arrived to the American continent uh, through a series of colonial and let's say uh, early capitalist um, contexts. So the first time I encountered this pattern was in Manaus, that is the biggest uh, city in the Amazon region. And it was in a square that it's called uh, Praça de São Sebastião. Um, and this uh, square was made uh, by uh, some robber entrepreneurs or robber barons are as they were called they created this um i don't know center for this prosperous city that was uh financed with the slavery work uh by the end of the 19th century and they imported not only the graphic design for this square but also the um, the stones that made this square uh as a portuguese pavement were brought from portugal and these all, all these uh, let's say, importation of culture uh, was financed with the money uh, from the extraction and exportation of, uh, of rubber. So for me, the, there was a very interesting exchange, colonial and capitalist exchange uh, of different materials. In this case, the exportation of rubber uh, that was uh, extracted from Amazonian trees the importation of these, let's say, cultural icon, and actually the material stones to build this uh, graphic design in this very early version of, uh, uh, let's say, a modernist uh, public space. So uh, with the sugars, we uh, reconstruct this, uh, a fragment of this square in the museum in Marrakesh, and Actually, this work is uh, in a state of uncertainty because uh, the idea is that to be completed the work, the installation um, should be intervened by visitors. And they actually, uh, at some point, we open to the public the intervention into this uh, mosaic let's call it like that and and people will go inside and mix the sugars and for me what is interesting is what symbolically uh, can be to dissolve this colonial pattern uh, and produce collectively afterwards it's uh, an spontaneous and collective image that we cannot um, let's say predict uh, so for me, this work in, in, in the current state of uncertainty 
it's really something that can, uh, I don't know, uh, put up some questions about this, uh, this time for us. Felipe, can you tell us just a little bit about this very remarkable geometric pattern that you found in the, in the Prasa in Manaus and that you replicated? Um, well, I've been following the history of this pattern. Um, it's very related to um, Roman mosaics and also some geometries that we can find in the Islam Islamic antiquity or in Islamic world. And apparently it migrated uh, in Europe and then from, let's say, Rome into the uh, into Portugal and Spain, and also it could be brought by the um, by the Islamic uh, colonization of the um, of Spain and Portugal, what what is now Spain and Portugal, and then it was brought into the American continent. And it's very interesting because near Manaus, um, there's the encounter of these two rivers. One is the Amazon River, and the other is Rio Negro, that it's the Black River. And these two rivers come from two different mountain systems. One is uh, the Andes, Cordillera de los Andes, and the other is the Guyanese Shield, or uh, School of Guyanese. And since these two rivers comes, uh, come from two different mountains, they have a different acidity. One is neutral and the other is acid. And when they meet, they don't mix instantly, but they walk uh, together, let's say, for 10 kilometers uh, before mixing. And this is a very interesting, like, natural phenomena. And, and, and this, when, when this design was brought into Manaus, uh, they wanted to commemorate these, um, let's say, natural phenomena that it's called uh, in Brazil, the Encontro das Aguas. Mm -hmm. um, and what is interesting is that uh, this process that was, I mean, from the 19th century, it was um, in the context of this colonial economy or, or pre-capitalist economy, was taken by Roberto Burle Marx, the Brazilian landscape architect, into Copacabana. And the promenade of uh, Copacabana has the same pattern but in, in Rio de Janeiro, it became like a modernist uh, symbol of the new Brazil or the progressive Brazil. And it's interesting how for people in, in, in Rio de Janeiro, it, it's, it's uh, um, an icon of modernity, you know? But it really, like this symbol really carries on with uh, the burden of, of colonial past. So I have, I have a lot of other questions for you, but what I'm going to do is just ask you one of them and then encourage uh, uh, our uh, participants to start thinking about their questions. A little bit later on in the conversation, we will, we will invite questions. But the one that I want to ask you is, uh, I think it's very beautiful the, that you brought this pattern and this work to Morocco. You just explained to us how this pattern probably came through Morocco at some point. Uh, and you brought it back, uh, of course, to another society where questions of um, hybridity, mixing, prejudice, et cetera, et cetera, are, are on the table uh, as they are everywhere, but with their particular valence that they have in Morocco. And I wonder uh, if you have any kind of process notes that you want to share about making this work in Morocco, either the meaning for you of making it in Marrakesh, or maybe uh, the experience of making it probably with collaborators um, who are on the ground in, in Morocco, or maybe just emotional notes from, from, that, from that. Well, uh, it's interesting because when we were um, having a conversation with Marianne of the part my participation in the exhibition and this work in particular, in particular, um, we found uh, with the team of the museum that actually sugar plantations and let's say a culture around the, the economy of sugar had been present in, in Morocco for some time. And there was like a material connection with the piece. So that was very interesting. And 
I, I couldn't travel to the installation process. So uh, what I did is that um, I sent some uh, plans and instructions to build this installation that uh, really requires not only the presence of the artists, but also the presence of visitors. So in a way, we engage with uh, uh, a COVID-19 situation before it actually happened. Yeah. And we managed to produce this uh, very complex installation uh, through, um, I don't know, this kind of distant communication. Uh, yeah. So Beautiful. these are Im images from the production of the piece on site. Um, this work is made with these giant uh, molds. And um, what I did is I sent to the museum staff some uh, plants to produce these molds. And then we were like uh, going over the installation online. Wonderful. Well, it looks beautiful. And uh, I only wish that I had made it to Marrakesh uh, before the, everything had to close down. Hopefully we can all actually see it again in a few months. Um, Rahima, I'd like to ask you also uh, to show us the work that you made. Um, and the work that you made is not work that can be done at a distance because it is, involves very much the artist's um, presence. Yeah, would you like me to talk through it or? Let's let maybe let's maybe um, see an image uh, so that we can have a visual reference point, and then you can tell us what we're looking at and um, and how and how the work happens. Because you have a very you have a you have a very particular methodology that you've been developing over over a few years now. Um, actually, what I'd like to do is kind of read Yoko Ono's instructions um, just like in the beginning of the catalog just to sort of draw her in to this conversation. Sure. Um, have you seen a horizon lately? If you have, watch it for a while, but you never know it may not last so long. Have you seen an evening light lately? If you have, watch it for a while, but you never know it may not be the same. Have you seen a snowflake lately? If you have, hold it in your hand, but you never know it may melt away. Have you been in love lately? If you have, hold it in your heart, but you never know it may be the last. And when Marianne asked me to be in the um, exhibition, it's really funny because I had been sort of thinking about um, Yoko Ono and female artists, feminist artists from the 70s, and how they used their bodies and just what they had to sort of express and create work. And this idea that without Yoko Ono's body, through these instructions, we can still sort of participate in her work and her work still lives on. And recently I've been thinking about a walk kind of in that way. I don't own this, this tool, this form, this movement. And even if my body can't be there, you know, through this action, people can use it as a mechanism to be in the world, to understand the world. And just thinking about, you know, the ways women have been the way they enact their freedoms in these little things, these really mundane things that may not be so easily recognizable as you know, a resistance. You know, things like going for a walk or like, you know, eye gestures, you know, rolling your eyes, you know, that are really powerful as these acts of resistance or these acts of, you know, freedom. Um, so yeah, a walk really began just trying to find new language, trying to find new form to kind of close this gap between what I was seeing or like what I was trying to explain and what I kind of knew. And yeah, so it just became this really experimental investigation into, you know, what is a photograph or how do I narrate the story 
or how do I, you know, capture this experience or this moment or this place through this set of movements and really implicating my body within that. So my body did become very central to creating this work, but actually now I realize that it's, I can't easily decenter it. You know, it, it isn't really about my body per se, it's really about this thing that was, you know, existed, this mechanism that existed before me. And in a way it's a form of time travel. You know, we can look back to the first man who walked and we can look forward into the future how people will be walking. Um, yeah. So let, but let, me, let me ask you to make it very, very, very material and concrete for people who may not have encountered your work before. Um, so you get to Marrakesh and then what do you, what do you do? How do you, how is the work made? Um, I commit myself to waking up early in the morning to just wander. So at that point we were housed in this resort. Um, I think it was a golf resort, I think where Macal is. So it was really sort of away from the main town. So I had to sort of walk through this, through the grounds of this place to sort of get outside. And when I got outside, I was met by a lot of these sort of buildings, these developments, and really no people whatsoever. And now I sort of realize, because sometimes it comes back to me later on, you know, about the space that I was wondering, like what it actually meant. And I now realize I was actually walking on really highly traumatized ground where these building developments were sprouting up and there really wasn't much of, you know, the natural world to be found. There were just these sort of, you know, plastic, all these building materials everywhere. And a walk in a way was a way for me to try and understand or try to process trauma and, you know, going over treading over the surface of things and trying to sort of sensitively just see what comes my way. I'm not really trying to sort of put words around it, but kind of trying to understand it in fragments maybe later on. Um, yeah. And so what, what comes your way is, uh, is intangible material, um, which you can then process and express in an embodied way or in form uh, or in shape, uh, and also uh, some amount of tangible materials that then kind of appear in a, in a, in a sculptural form uh, that, you, that, you, that you produce. Yeah, in a way the walk itself is a thread. It's a way of sort of drawing these different things that I'm encountering or that I'm naturally drawn to together. So it was interesting that in Marrakesh as well, as well as Lagos, where I've done a walk, there are lots of palm trees. So I, you know, one of the materials I'm constantly drawn to are palm tree husks, and they look really sort of, almost like they could have been shed from like human skin. So I started collecting those and making, I made it into this, if you see in the installation of video and photographs into the sculpture, and another thing about Microsoft was the oranges and sort of seeing all these orange. So once I was you know, walking in the market and one of the simple encounters that I had was literally just buying oranges and ingesting those oranges. And this idea that things come through you as a way of knowing the world, you know, this ingestion, this idea of ingesting things and what comes out at the other end. So this idea of the residues of this act or this experience of traversing this time and this space and this location. Yeah. And yeah, the installation itself just took a, a, a absolutely different you know, form than the ones that I've done in Lagos. So I have, again, I have a lot of questions for you, but I want to delegate that, that role to the people who are on this, on this call, which, and they can start thinking about their questions. Um, 
and put them in the chat box and we will uh, move to questions in, in a few minutes. But let me ask you one question uh, before we then go on to Marianne. And my question for you, Rahima, is about uh, where you are now, Abuja, and uh, how you are, how you have been developing the walk concept, not only for yourself, but for other people uh, in Abuja. Uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the walk space in Abuja and what it's been doing. And maybe uh, you may have provisional thoughts about how that, uh, how the, how the, the, the valence or the, or the essence of that uh, is being, is being uh, infused or changed by the current circumstances. Yeah, I created a workspace really to create a home for myself and a home for this work that I was creating. Um, in Abuja, there, there aren't many art spaces and if they are, they you know, they want to see something framed on the wall that they can sell. Um, and usually if I want to show my work, you know, I have to go to Lagos. So it was really sort of this way of, you know, how can I survive as an artist and share my work as an artist exactly where I live? So a workspace was sort of born from that, where I was like, I can determine the kind of art that I want to present to people and also bring other bodies and other limbs in. And I think just this idea of a workspace, you know, thinking about other workspaces like parks and pavements, especially in Africa and West Africa, you know, there are these highly contested spaces where everyone has a stake and has a claim in it. And multiple things are happening at the same time. There's like, you know, people eating, there are people sleeping, that people just moving through. So it's, you know, anything can happen or the or workspace can be used in any sort of way. Um, yeah, so it really became that for me. So for the people who are listening on this call, uh, what you need to do is go to the little chat box, open up the chat box and uh, you can issue your questions. Uh, put them in the uh, to all panelists so that so that we can see them and uh, what I will do is um, select a few questions uh, and so in a couple of minutes we'll go to the questions and you have to come up with questions because this your this is your part of this uh, of this exercise I don't know if there's two of you or ten of you or a hundred of you but whoever's there uh, we're counting on you to have your questions about the practices and the ideas of these very brilliant of these very brilliant artists Marianne, uh, in curating this exhibition, uh, you took your title from a text by Yoko Ono, which um, Rahima has, has shared with us. And uh, I'm I jealous because I wanted to read it, but she did it uh, in a perfect way. No, no, it's great, yes. <laughs> but, but what, um, and, and I know that, that, that uh, Yoko had a version of this installation up in at least one other place where um, it said, have you seen The Horizon lately? And you made a small adjustment from the definite article to the indefinite article. Uh, and maybe, maybe you have a comment on that. But I want to ask you, um, what is it that, um, that called out to you, that interpellated you in, in this little aphorism of Yoko's um, and in this idea of horizon and what this question of horizon meant for you as an organizing principle for an exhibition, for a group exhibition. And then maybe um, we can talk about how our horizons are changing at the moment. Yeah, that's, a, that's a lot of questions in one question, uh, Siddhartha. Um, yes, I mean, coming back on the title, the title comes from a song. Uh, so it's different, it's with an A and not with the horizon. And the horizon she used, uh, have you seen the horizon lately in uh, other billboards, you know, that's uh, in the continuation of uh, our instructions work, you know, showing this uh, message on huge billboard in this public space. So what inspired me was the song. It's a 1973 uh, song in the album uh, Infinite Universe, if I'm not, I, I think it's a, it's a title and I, I just I don't know why I, when I was making research uh, on a possible statement for this exhibition, I think we were all like, as all curators, you know, we all live in the same world. 
and with the many exhibition on the Anthropocene and things like that. I, I was never really interested uh, in that, but then I found this song uh, and I found the lyrics and I say, yes, I want to use it. It was really my starting point. And, you know, in my process, I need to have this uh, connection, text or music or literature. And then it, it started with that. And for me, it was incredible to see uh, how she was a kind of visionary, like, so uh, not only an activist, but seeing that, remember, it was in 1973. Yes. And, as Rahima said uh, before, it's it's uh, it's a way she has you know not managed is not a good word her career. I think she hasn't managed anything. She just uh, you know reacts you know with this with her body, but she inspired her so much uh, to to be honest. So this was a starting point, and also maybe poetry. Uh, in the catalog, I also put an excerpt uh, from a beautiful poem by um, Mahmoud Tarvish. Uh, it was important for me as well, but I think the catalog is available on the Macal website now, uh, so you can have the PDF and, and just check afterwards. I think it's a beautiful uh, little catalog. And, and then it was also the idea of, um, I like to work, you know, in a collaborative way with artists, you know, I just put a few things on the table and I start the conversation with them. So it's always a little bit difficult for the institution because they say they would like me to come with a list, with a statement and everything is written and defined. And I say, no, my work consists in creating a space first, you know, a kind of uh, how, how would I define it uh, to maybe open new horizons of thought with the artist? And by doing so, we need to have a conversation before. And that's how, you know, we, we started the conversation uh, before with Felipe when we met in Bogota with Raima. When we met, she was part of the Bamako, my, my edition, uh, when I curated the Bamako encounters and so on. And it was great to see that this division and uh, me, it's really great. And I think uh, real and I really appreciate the way uh, the Macal, which is a young museum, is trying to build new models. Uh, how can you? You know, like we, it's like a box and we tried a toolbox and, and we are allowed to experiment with this. It's really wonderful. So we did that with only 12 artists, I must say. I didn't want to have this large uh, format, as you know, and all the artists who are in dialogue with me knows that I'm not interested in hanging, you know, things on the wall. It's, uh, it's how we exchange before, how we, open the possibility to create something, a new knowledge altogether, and the a possibility of encounter and sharing. And that's we did. That's what we did with uh, Rahima told us uh, um, about uh, her process, but the process was done, her walk, uh, daily early walk in Marrakesh uh, were, were during a creative um, residency. Uh, we had six other artists uh, before the exhibitions and it was an incredible time we spent during two weeks uh, uh, together because we shared but it's also it was also the the idea to engage with uh with the local uh, and it, it's it's a lot of effort for a curator for the team in the institution for everybody but i think it's 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 what makes things interesting for for the artist and also how we i would just say the collaboration we had with the uh, workers at the museum with the mediation before uh with people coming and seeing us you know uh installing uh, the, the 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 exhibition so all this for me it's important you know uh in the process it's not the process doesn't start with the opening of the exhibition 
um, yes, I don't know if I answered your question. And <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, uh, in 1973, Yoko Ono, um, and uh, of course, this, you could you could say this about any period that it's a very generative period uh, if you if you if you start investigating it. But this moment of the 1970s and the particular kind of global crisis that was experienced in the late 60s into the early 70s uh, and the artistic responses uh, is there is there something particularly kind of in the genealogy of this moment that encourages us to, 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 to look at the 1970s? But actually, uh, to be a little bit straightforward, I'm not so interested in looking at, you know, the 1973, uh, uh, what happened at that time. I'm, I'm interested, uh, you know, the, the present time. And that's, um, but maybe we need to look, you're right, we, we need to look at the past to understand the present and maybe build a future. Uh, and some of the artists in my exhibitions were uh, like, really wanted to dig in the past. But uh, Rahima, I think, was in the present time, but with her time, you know, uh, and maybe with the, it was interesting to, to, to see also how it was another time. Um, so no, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure. What I was interested in maybe is, uh, is you know, what, what, with what we, uh, with this current uh, crisis, uh, I think we, it's a moment uh, when we urgently take a look at the world. Uh, but uh, it, maybe we, we see without seeing things. Uh, so my idea is how, maybe the questions uh, uh, in, the, in the exhibition would go around the idea of how can we emancipate you know, our gaze and maybe how can we uh, take action uh, on the world and live together uh, better. Like to be a bit, it's maybe a bit uh, simplistic what I say, but I was interested in the, in, in the artist's response with new approaches uh, and it's not the idea of the collapse of the world and that the, what they are I think what was interesting and what is interesting in their approach is how they are in favor of the transformation uh, and and how they explore the what I say like possible new landscapes so the it's a very strange moment right now in terms of horizons because uh, our horizons are uh, very limited right now in a very concrete way. Uh, so many of us have been uh, stuck in, in our homes or in our neighborhoods at most, certainly in our cities and very much within our national borders. It's been a, it's been a time of uh, horizons closing in a very practical and legal even way. Uh, and at the same time, uh, here we are uh, discussing via a particular, you know, even video technology, this video meeting technology of this quality wasn't around two or three years ago, let alone, let alone a longer time. So we're, 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 we're trying to, we're trying, we're trying to bust out in this very far away and dematerialized horizon, but so that we can be in interaction with each other. And so uh, I, I'm kind of connecting here to the question that Othman, is putting on on uh, on us, which is a very Ahmad is asking. Uh, the, he has a very general question to all of us. These past two months were obviously extremely difficult for everybody. How do you think this will impact art in general and the way art should be exhibited and experienced as an artist, as a curator, and as a writer journalist? I mean, this is the big question that is hovering around, phrased in one way or another. Pretty much every discussion that's taking place in the creative and cultural world right now. And um, uh, the, the the prompt of your exhibition, Marianne, is a, is a nice one because it allows us to organize that question around around the idea of horizon and what kinds of spaces we are acting in, we are able to act in, uh, or we prefer or choose to act in um, right now in this weird provisional time that we don't really know exactly how it's going to uh, change over the next months and, and years. Maybe I, I can turn back to the artists and ask, um, 
uh, Rahima, you know, have you seen a horizon lately? What does the horizon look like for you? Um, well, there have been really clear, beautiful skies ever since airplanes and cars sort of took a back seat. So that has been really kind of beautiful to see, actually. And um, just thinking about, you know, before this crisis, how easy it was for, you, for us to just kind of like, okay, I'm gonna fly here, fly there, even though it was a little bit difficult, Nigeria, the visa process, everything. But now really seeing, visibly seeing in the sky what that was doing and my part in that, I mean, how that, I was implicated in that. And thinking now, you know, going into the future, if I am to fly, you know, or go somewhere, really thinking about what that is doing to the climate, to our world. Is it really worth it to go for two or three days? <clears throat> and so that's really what I've been thinking about. And I think what will really, the kind of gatherings I think that will survive after this will have to be really meaningful for us to sort of fly over continents, you know, to get there, it has to be really meaningful. Have you been walking? I have been walking um, very early when, when there's not many people around. Um, right now, thank God, it is the lockdown. Um, because here it's always been sort of this debate about people's livelihoods versus this impending maybe mass death that could occur from coronavirus. And, you know, just the, the tension has just been, just feeling the tension, people literally not being able to make a living. Um, I remember one morning I was walking down towards um, Unity Fountain and I saw this young girl who sells, you know, those packeted water sachets? Yes. Um, the small ones, you know, I think they sell like for like five naira. And I wasn't quite sure whether it was she was crying because there were these sounds coming from her. And I had to take a moment to just be like, wow, like, people are willing may actually choose making a living more than I think this possible kind of gamble of getting coronavirus. And I think just these little stories, just seeing that. Felipe, um, what about your horizon at the moment? Well, um, it's um, like for me, it had been a time for really take some time and observe uh, it's very difficult to have a futuristic approach right now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, this uncertainty makes difficult to come up with a new model. And for me, I'm, I'm just observing what is happening, how certain institutions and uh, structures in the art world respond, what it's the immediate response. And um, for this question, I thought about some models in the past that maybe can tell us something today. I don't know if they will be viable or not, but uh, I was um, remembering the, the, um, uh, the cabinet of curiosities that uh, it's a preform of a cultural institution in which people were collecting objects from different places in the world. And of course, this was in the middle of uh, a, a very colonial structure. But um, I don't know if uh, art will be, will have some retroactive coming back of the object. Um, I'm, I really have like a, a very big question about art that is depending on the physical presence of participants and uh, and how this will affect uh, like a political or 
collective approach to art uh, because if we cannot gather in public spaces or semi-public spaces like museums or other art institutions how this will affect our our sense of uh, political action and, um, and political thought in a way um, i was thinking also of about the um, the messenger pigeons that was this very um, poetical way of sending messages. And uh, I think that we humans are, uh, we have this drive to communicate. And sometimes we don't have anything special to communicate. I mean, the content sometimes is not that important. But then this drive, this desire to communicate is what it becomes important. So maybe finding, uh, I don't know, um, poetical alternative mediums to send messages. Uh, it's something that uh, we also have to think about. And just to finish my intervention, um, I was yesterday remembering an alternative economy that was had been popular here in, in Colombia in some neighborhoods. Families cannot afford a washing machine. So uh, what happened is that some people have a washing machine that rent for hours by hours, and then they take it from one home to the other. Uh, and you can rent this washing machine for one day and uh, clean your clothes. And then uh, a guy will take this washing machine to another home. And I was thinking about these, I don't know, alternative economies and these ways in which uh, under certain economic restrictions or restric restrictions of mobility, there's, there are ways. Oops. Uh -oh. We have lost the yeah, connection. We have lost the connection. Everybody okay. else connected okay? Rahima, you've yeah. got us? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll let we'll let okay. Felipe we'll let Felipe uh, uh, reconnect. What I'm gonna what I'm gonna do I have a few uh, like I can see the questions uh, before I what I'd like to do, Marianne, what I'd like to do is I'd like to I'd like to aggregate the questions. Um, uh, okay. because, we are, because we have a lot of very interesting comments that are coming in. Yeah. On, and, and they're and they're on several themes and, and and so I'd like to aggregate them so that everybody's voice is um, is, is heard uh, one one theme is about history uh, and we have um, uh, we have Owen yeah, I, I saw I saw Owen's questions and uh, I think everybody can see it and and well, someone well, again, moderator privilege I, I, I just want <laughs> I'd like to get this yes. all on the table because we have a limited time and, I, and so Owen is asking the artist in particular um, and also Marianne about uh, whether making an installation in Marrakesh caused you to engage with particular histories related to the history of Morocco, even if from a distance, Felipe, uh, or um, to think about uh, the history of post-independence Africa, among many others. There's also a question uh, from someone else who, uh, yes, uh, Isabel Perez is asking a more general question that connects to that, which is, uh, from an artistic point of view, in the moment that we're living in in the world right now, how do we dig into the past in order to improve our future? So there's a history question, and, and one of you can, can address that. There's also a question of uh, um, attendance and how art happens. Uh, we have um, Nisreen El Hakuni is saying the art industry seems to be in some of a state of denial. Shouldn't we already be embarking on new attendance patterns? And in the same vein, uh, Tamar Gran is saying, uh, how do you see art gatherings in the future, near term and long term? How much can and should move online? Would you curate online as a curator? Would you participate online as an artist? Would you review online as a critic, etc.? What happens to physical shows? Are they only local and, and not so much traveling? So there's a question about how we look at art. And then the, the, the third thing is um, the more prospective question. I'd like to Acknowledge the comment from Innocent uh, Ekejube, who says that um, uh, talking about a horizon instead of the horizon uh, helps us appreciate 
that there are various horizons you, and the fact that you can't see one doesn't mean that there isn't another one just beyond the hill. It solidifies the idea of multiple realities. And perhaps a horizon question is coming from Galia Shrevi, who's saying, what are your plans for the next few months? So maybe let's talk quickly about history, and then let's talk quickly about uh, a few provisional thoughts on how people are actually going to make and look at art. And then we can wrap up the conversation. Each of you can very quickly tell us what's on your plate right now. Who wants to talk about history? Marianne? Um, yes, maybe, but it's, um, uh, I, many artists, I must say, in, my exhibit, in the exhibition are digging um, into history uh, to inform us um, about the present about the prison, uh, I, I must say. But uh, the approach is that it's also interesting because they are using other types of archives. If we, if we for instance, uh, we have a large iteration, I think the largest, the largest iteration uh, so far of Kakweni Kiwanga's installation, Flowers for Africa. And it's interesting how she's using uh, these photographs from uh, event during independence time in each African uh, country and it's a protocol so the, the picture is shown to a florist and the florist has to reinterpret a floral arrangement from mm -hmm. what you see on the picture most of the time a black and white uh, picture and it's very interesting because at that time, at the time of independence in those large floral arrangements, it was uh, really the, the symbol of, uh, of the colonialization because you had like, most of the flowers were imported uh, and you had uh, some flowers that were local. And if we reproduce the, 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 the large iteration, we have, I think seven uh, or 11, uh, flowers for Africa, which means 11 uh, countries she's been, you know, uh, where Jose Capquani has found an archive, a photo archive, and we have used it uh, to the florist. And it's very interesting to see how uh, even the process, we've been there when the florists were, 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 were in, in, in the garden preparing, you know, the floral arrangement to be placed on museum uh, uh, pedestals. And we really laughed, I'm sorry to say that, because when it was about uh, flowers for Morocco, uh, they felt obliged to do a huge <laughs> And I, I remember I was with Ochman and we said, okay, listen, guys, thank you. But, you know, they felt the pressure, you know, Morocco, we have to do the, that's the biggest one. And, and really, but it was nice. It was their way to reinterpret uh, this archive. And, and, and it's, it's another material, but I think it says a lot. And even us, to, uh, if we want to engage and unfortunately uh, we haven't been able to to have all this kids uh, uh, workshop and isn't that but I'm sure that from the first reaction on the on the on the inaugural days of the exhibition I knew it was a good way a good point of entry to history that is totally different from other you know archive usual more academic archive but she also stated what is the status of an archive? Who define, yeah. you know, what is history and what is not history and how we can use other elements and, and, and to re, maybe re, rewrite another history. And it's also the way to create another interpretation of the present time to those archives. And to, to finish the story with, um, with Capuani Kiwanga, the, the flower, uh, the floral arrangements are left, you know, there were fl fresh flowers and they're now drying, you know, on, the, on their pedestal. And it, it's also a very strong metaphor of, uh, of you know, all the hope uh, at the time of independence and the great disenchantment now. And it's also a metaphor of the word, I must say, at the present time, you know, it's a time of crisis. Rahima, uh, uh, Marianne sort of situated your work as being in the present. Um, in what ways is your work also uh, an, some kind of encounter 
with history, and if so, what histories and um, what 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 is what is the method of working with history that you that 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 inspires you at this moment in time? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting how people talk about history, like it's this thing that is like far away that you have to engage with that is when it's like right there, you know, and I think treading through a landscape really lightly, everything comes at you, you know, it's the past, it's the present, it's the future. And even just thinking about, you know, oranges, these encounters that I had with orange, people selling oranges in um, Marrakesh and the bread sellers, these are things, little mundane things that have existed and have intertwined through people's daily lives, no matter what has been happening, you know. So this in itself, these things, these little things are important and they're historical and I'm encountering them. And I think sometimes it's not my place to explain, you know, it's not my place to dig, you know, just by walking on the surface. I think enough, there's enough rich material there for it to come through in the installation where an audience, someone coming through the installation can have this feeling of nostalgia when they see a plant that I may not be able to name but they know it well. So it's not about me sort of narrating yeah. this sort of thing. This and and Felipe, Felipe uh, the, the work that you presented, it was first iterated. It, your work is obviously extremely informed by history. It's a kind of historical investigation in, in certain ways. Uh, you, it was first iterated um, seven or eight years ago, I, I, I believe. Um, I wonder if your, your, oops, do we have Felipe? I think we've been having connection difficulties with Felipe. He is, he is, he has now vanished. Okay, so we'll 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 let Felipe uh, uh, reconnect. Let me. I'm going to merge together because we're coming towards the end of our hour. The other two themes, which are about how we're going to be looking at art uh, in the in the near to middle future, or how the viewer, the 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 audience, is going to be looking at art and how art is going to be presented in the near to middle future. And how do we feel about everything kind of going online? Let's connect that with the question of what each of you is doing in these next few months um, while we're in this weird space. Um, and I'd like to also uh, add a question from Ange, uh, who's saying, I may have a wrong point of view, but I see more and more newspapers, people, et cetera, for whom this period is being described as a quote unquote opportunity to produce for artists. Of course, we have to produce so as not to be too overwhelmed by the situation, but will these productions really be relevant to our present? So from the point of view of making art, making exhibitions, making work, but also from the point of view of putting work to be received, uh, what about work being received only online or work being received in real life only locally and not internationally? Um, thoughts on any of that, um, Rahima? Um. I think I've always had this, find it, found it problematic of thinking of artists as like these machines that produce things. You know, I didn't come from that tradition. Um, I was walking before coronavirus came and yes. I'm walking now and I'm probably going to be walking afterwards. And I, you know, this is a time, I mean, a walk itself was produced because I, I felt a need to, to, to lean back, to actually rest and not rush into trying to do anything. You know, it was about, you know, encountering a, a something, a crisis trying to put language around it and realizing that actually at this point, I'm not quite understanding what this is, and I'm going to take a step back and let things unfold really naturally. What about the idea that the work is going to be experienced uh, primarily online or perhaps in very hyper local spaces for the foreseeable future? You know, I think there's this anxiety as well for things to be a certain way, and I think if it has to be this way right now, 
this is what the world needs, this is what we all need right now, to sort of contract, um, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. And I even realized even I was so busy doing one thing after the other, that there are so many things that I sort of forgot about where I was right here. And it's, you know, this opportunity to really engage with this space as an artist, you know, that I, maybe I was looking outwards so much. Marianne, uh, not to put you on the spot, but I know that you uh, have been putting together a, a, a very large, important exhibition uh, in, for, in Paris. So this, this, this situation has really kind of caught you at a, at a complicated moment. Um, so these questions about how the work can be made, shown, who can travel, who's going to be where, et cetera, are, I, I'm sure, ones that you don't, you don't have the luxury of just sitting back and theorizing about them. You have, you have some real questions to deal with. Uh, yeah, I, and I, I would like to come back that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would like to react, and I think that uh, with Ange was uh, writing, uh, I think not everybody has the privilege just to spend time and reading and, I don't know, re rearranging the bookshelves and this kind of stuff of, of researching. I think that we it's, it's a tough period, like uh, as Raima mentioned, I mean, we, uh, for a lot of workers or in, in the art um, uh, sector and artists and technicians and all this, it's, it's a very difficult time, but it was difficult before the crisis. It's just now uh, even more difficult. Um, so my reaction, I don't want to, to, to evoke this exhibition at Palais de Tokyo now, uh, but you know, I'm not the only one, you know, with the show canceled. It's, and um, I know Palais de Tokyo is a large institution and uh, we hopefully will find a solution. As you may know, uh, we're not a large institution or museum and not allowed to open uh, in France and maybe not before, I mean, we don't know, maybe in July, maybe in September, which makes it very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to think about a new program of exhibition. But then I'd like just to come back on this, in, um, on the fact that, you know, we, you have this kind of, inju um, of I would say, injunction, injunctions yes. to, uh, to produce, you know, would have to write text or artists would would be more creative but what the point you know it's it's exactly you know um the idea of uh production our production of doing things that is uh, that we should question at the moment you know so for me uh is probably if there is a, an opportunity with this pandemic or it's maybe the chance for a radical rethinking of uh, the social role of the arts and the, and the art institutions. And I found very, very inspiring uh, a recent essay by Achille Membe, mm -hmm. and uh, which I would like to read if you love, because I have it here. It's yes. on the right to breast. And I think it's a universal right uh, to breast. And it's, and like just one sentence, it say, in other words, a day after will come, but only with a giant rupture, the result of radical imagination. And, and uh, well, there's more. And I like this uh, idea. I think it was very inspiring. So what does it mean, a radical imagination? For me, I think it, we need a, a really huge social, political, and financial shift everywhere, uh, mostly. We need new narratives, and we also need art space to be inhabited by new epistemologies. So I'll how be, can we do? Very, I'll be very honest and say that in the last, just in the last couple of days, I've seen some posts on Instagram or so on of um, people actually going and looking at art in galleries. Um, I think in Dubai, in Seoul, in a few in a few places, galleries are not, are now open. And I had a I had a moment of like, oh my God, I would love to I would love to go to a gallery right now and actually see art in that context. But on the other hand, 
uh, I think, as Rahima says, we are going through something that needs to happen, uh, something that is happening, something bigger than us, something world historical. And uh, it does require that we um, adjust to it and think with it and use this opportunity, as you say, Marianne. Yeah, but we have to probably imagine forms of common life uh, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. commonality, but, you know, and at the same time, we, as we, we have to, to be careful and, you know, with all the social distancing and we'll have to keep it. It's really a paradox, you know, when we cannot shake hands and shake hands means peace, means contact. And now it's like, as if we are all enemies, you know, not being able to, 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 to connect. But maybe I think that Rahima mentioned it, it's, it's maybe a process of maybe global art growth, you know, calming down, just less exhibitions. I really believe in the physicality of words. I mean, no, I don't believe in the digital exhibition and, and so on. And I also refuse as soon as we will be able uh, to travel. I will travel again. Uh, we need to travel, and but probably not to travel uh, one week or two days for a conference. Never again. And I never did that really. Uh, I want to, but I need encounters. And my fear now is that you know the pandemic will serve uh, as an excuse for governments mostly Western governments to close the borders and we need exchanges, we need contacts and uh, we need to continue um, to, the artists need to continue to come in residency wherever in the world, not only in Europe, but uh, it, for me it's really important that we keep that and, and that is, yeah. We have well, I to. Think I, can, uh, I think I can say that without fear of contradiction, that for all of us here and probably everybody else on this call, uh, our respective governments are uh, probably making things more difficult for us going forward than they are making things easier. And so, for those of us who are inspired by a challenge, uh, we have a lot of inspiration in front of us. Um, but with that said, this has been a lovely, uh, as 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 suboptimal as this medium is. This has been a lovely uh, conversation, a lovely encounter. Felipe writes, hola, I couldn't get back to the conversation. I lost connection. Please say goodbye on my part to everybody. So goodbye from Felipe. Uh, uh, we've gone for just over an hour. I'd like to thank you all for having been on this call. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Rahima. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Miriam and the Macau team. And I hope that we can all get together again soon, frequently this way. And yeah. uh, in, in person soon. And uh, thank you very much, Siddhartha. I just want to add, and maybe uh, Marion will say that, um, you know, we would like to uh, have another conversation in French this time, because it's also the effect, you know, like not everybody speaks English in Morocco or in Western Africa. And it's also, you know, we also want to be fair with uh, and have another uh, conversation next week. But uh, I let Miriam um, uh, conclude. You said everything. <laughs> thank you so much, Siddhartha and Raima and Felipe and all the participants. It was great to have you. Great, Miriam, the last word from the host. <laughs> thank you so much, all. Thank you. It was really, really interesting. And um, it, we're super happy um, of course um, we lost uh, connection but it's part of the the, the game i mean it's uh, but we're really happy to to have this platform to keep on uh, doing what are we are doing about mediation and making art more accessible to everyone so uh, that's why we're going on french next week so uh, with Marianne and uh, Sandrine Pelchi and Gael Schwann, other artists of the exhibition. Thank you all for joining us and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Merci. Bye. Au revoir. Bye. Bye.